This is Tumani Kumar, and it's time to open up the briefcase with Casey Holdall. Greetings, Blizzard fans, and welcome to the briefcase, episode 84 of the briefcase. I am your host, Casey Holdall, and there is a month left in the NBA season. And while it's not unexpected, at some point in time in the next week, the Portland Trail Blazers will be mathematically eliminated from playoff contention. But that's not important, at least not this season. What is important is that there are a number of players who've been out of the lineup due to injuries who are starting to return, which means there's a whole lot this team can accomplish in terms of development here in the home stretch of the regular season. And that has always been the goal of the 2023-24 season. Improvement and development, not necessarily the playoffs. We'll get a lay of the land in Rip City with one month to go and hear from Dwayne Hankins, the Trailblazers president of business operations, about the recently signed lease with the city, how the business side has fared this season, the prospect of the WNBA in Portland after a bit of a setback, and the state of NBA broadcast deals on this edition of The Briefcase. New York Portland Trailblazers are 1-4 in, in their last five games with two relatively close losses to the Timberwolves and the Thunder, two convincing losses to the Rockets and the Celtics, and one overtime victory versus the Toronto Raptors. The Blazers host the Hawks and the Knicks in another all mode center back-to-back, Portland's second in as many weeks, before heading out to face the Pelicans and the Bulls in the weirdest two-game road trip in my time with the team. Just a reminder that as of this recording, the Trailblazers currently sit at 18-46, and 46, which puts them at 14th in the Western Conference, ahead of only the Spurs, who have already been eliminated from playoff contention with 14 wins this season, and is 26th lead-wide behind the Grizzlies with 23 wins, and ahead of the Hornets with 16 wins. It's almost an impossibility that the Blazers will finish this season anywhere below 27th, seeing as how the Detroit Pistons and the Washington Wizards only have 11 wins. But as of right now, I would say the Spurs, the Hornets, and the Blazers, and maybe if you want to extend it out, the Grizzlies and the Raptors are teams that could end up somewhere in the 27, 26, 25, 24 range. Obviously, the reason to be interested in that is because of lottery odds. Even though a lot of people are saying that this draft is not expected to be an especially good one, there's always players, great players that come out of every single draft, maybe not as many as you would like. But generally, it's been my experience when people say it's a bad draft, it generally ends up about average. The really bad drafts are the ones that people just assume are going to be average. And then you look back on them a few years later, and a lot of those players that draft evaluators like are already out of the league. And while none of those aforementioned teams are likely to win a lot of games anytime soon, if you look at Portland's schedule, it's got to be about one of the hardest of those teams near the bottom of the standings who are all, I wouldn't say playing for lottery position, but at least considering lottery position right now. If you look at Portland's remaining schedule, very likely they will only be favored once in the game versus the Wizards in Washington, D.C. in a few weeks throughout the rest of their schedule. And they're playing a whole lot of teams fighting for playoff position. So while wins have been tough to come by this season, they're probably going to get even tougher to come by in the last month of the 2023-24 campaign. One of the things that would make the end of the Trailblazers 2023-24 season a little bit better is if players were able to come back from injury to play in the last month of the season, and that does seem to be happening. Both DeAndre Ayton and Scoot Henderson returned to action recently after missing extended time due to various injuries. In the two games since sitting out a little over a week with a bum hand, DeAndre Ayton has averaged 26 points on 57% shooting from the field, 17 rebounds, an assist and a steal, and half a block in 36 and a half minutes per game. DeAndre Ayton has been phenomenal in 2024, really excited about what we've been seeing from him, a guy who I would like to see even get more touches as the season goes on here. I know that a lot of the season is about developing some of the young players, particularly the guards. I would really like to see them put a lot of emphasis on DeAndre Ayton in the last month of the season. He's been an absolute bright spot this season, and I think there's plenty of reason to try to give him as many minutes, as many touches as they can in this last month of the season. As for Scoot Henderson, he's also played two games since missing around three weeks with an adductor strain and is averaging 13 points on 42% shooting from the field, 22% shooting from three, 6.5 assists, and 3.5 rebounds in 30 minutes a game. Scoot came off the bench in his first game back, the overtime victory versus the Raptors, and started in the loss to the Celtics. If healthy, I would imagine that Scoot is going to be in the starting lineup for the rest of the season. In other injury news, the right hamstring strain that has kept Jeremy Grant out of a few games recently seems to be improving as the status for Wednesday's game has been updated to questionable. Malcolm Brogdon, Shaden Sharp, and Jabari Walker, who hasn't played since the loss of the Thunder on March 6th because of a hip issue, all remain out. I would be shocked if we didn't see Jabari again this season. I think there's a pretty good chance we see Shaden Sharp again this season. Not so sure we're going to see Malcolm Brogdon on the court again this season. Checking in on my neighbors up here on the peninsula of the Rip City Remix, their inaugural season is coming to a close, though you still have time to get up to the University of Portland to check them out if you haven't already. I highly suggest you do. The Remix split a pair of games versus the Texas Legends at UP on Sunday and Tuesday and will host the South Bay Lakers on Friday, 6 p.m. tip-off by the way, before heading to California to play the Stockton Kings and a pair of games versus the Ontario Clippers before heading to Texas for back-to-back games versus the Austin Spurs. 
The remix finished off the regular season by hosting the Santa Cruz Warriors on March 29th and 30th, so those are the games to target if you want to be certain to see a game in person before the end of the remix season one. They do have a playoff in the G League, and the remix are fifth in the Western Conference, so it seems like they have a good chance of advancing, but good luck finding any updated information on how the playoffs work in the G League. I think they take the top six teams from each conference, and it's like a one-game playoff, and then I think the finals are a best of three, but again... Not a whole lot of updated information out there about the G League playoffs. I'll get some to you as they get closer. But the important thing is, if you haven't gotten a chance to see a remix game yet, you absolutely should. Tickets are incredibly reasonable. It's great for the family. Take them up to UP. Spend a day in North Portland. Check out Santa Cruz 2 or King Burrito. Or see a movie at either of the two St. John's Beer Theaters, St. John's Cinema and the McMinimans. I don't even know what it's called, but there's two of them. They're pretty close together. Drive over the bridge. Just enjoy North Portland and some remix basketball. It's a nice place up here. All right, a new and very quick segment here on The Briefcase, which makes sense since it is The Briefcase, the unofficial Matisse Steibel book club. After the video was posted about how much Matisse likes receiving books as gifts, we've had a lot of response from people wanting to know what Matisse is reading these days. So I figured this podcast, a good place to give you periodical updates on where Matisse is at in terms of his readership. So let you guys know, the first update from the unofficial Matisse Steibel book club, Matisse just finished reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Gary Adams. He is now reading The Pilgrimage by Paulo Coelho, who also wrote The Alchemist, which I believe he has also already read. So there you go. That has been your unofficial Matisse Steibel book club update. Moving on once again, Blazers' offensive and defensive rating is basically unchanged from last week. Still 28th in offensive rating, still 21st in defensive rating, still 27th in net rating. In terms of betting on the Blazers, Portland went 1-2 and two versus the spread in their last three games. They were 6.5-point dogs to the Rockets and lost by 16. They were 2.5-point dogs to the Raptors and won by 10. 10 point went in overtime, by the way, too. You should get something extra for that. And there were 11.5-point dogs to the Celtics and lost by 22 to bring them to 1-2. and two versus the spread in their last three games. Portland is now 30 and 34 versus the spread this season. And with 18 wins, Trailblazers need to go 11 and 7 in order to hit the over on their season projection of 28.5 wins. Those of you who took the under can probably start considering what to do with your winnings. Perhaps make a charitable donation with your dirty money. And finally, let's go ahead and hear from Trailblazers President of Basketball Operations, Dwayne Hankins, about a whole host of business topics, including the lease deal the Trailblazers recently signed with the city of Portland, but plenty more to talk about as well. Just the state of business in Rip City, some of the improvements that have been made to the arena recently, some specifics of the lease deal, why it's important, and what that means to fans, some general talk about the WNBA after that setback earlier this year, and a little bit of discussion about the Trailblazers TV deal and the broader issue of TV rights deals in the NBA. Always enjoy talking to Dwayne. Always a straight shooter. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you learned something. Give it a listen. All right, we were joined by Dwayne Hankins, Trailblazers President of Business Operations. Uh, also, uh, top of the org chart, my boss. I, 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 I was going to say, I guess. I don't guess. I know for a fact. <laughs> Dwayne, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Casey. You're always great with these intros. I love it. And thanks for having me on again. I'm always honored to join your show. Now, first off, what is the state of the the business of the Portland Trailblazers right now? Obviously, the wins and losses this season uh, a bit tough, but you see the the support in the arena, and it still looks pretty good. There's still interest from the fan base. I, I think there's a lot of cause for for people to be interested in this team. So I, I'm curious if if you're seeing that reflected at all in the business side of the organization. Yeah, definitely. It's been it's actually been a lot of fun because I think what we're focused on here, um, as as usual, is just building out sort of a championship ready infrastructure. Structure. So, I mean, that started with some of the work that we did in the arena in the last couple of years, which is always fun to get projects out of the way. It was getting the G League up and running, which is, is, is doing its job and being a great player development tool for our basketball side and a great R&D tool for our business side. And so it's been busy. It's been fun. You know, of course, you always want you know, better results on the court, but it's, it's what we're building, I think off the court to help support success down the road. That's been, that's been really, really fun for us. And yeah, it's been, it's been good. Yeah. What what are you hearing from, from the fans and, and from sponsors and from, from the people that you're dealing with on a regular basis about their thoughts on the trailblazers this season? Yeah, I think, I think most, you know, most fans, especially our season ticket holders, they've been unbelievably supportive. They've been incredible. We're in the middle of renewal, actually just passed our deadline on Friday and renewal was, was again strong as it was last year. So this is a fan base that, that is here for it through and through, which is really great. You know, our partners, they're always looking for more ways to integrate their programs, their, their partnerships with us. 
we are in the process of really trying to be a bit more, I'd say, authentic and thoughtful about the kinds of partnerships that we bring to our partners mm-hmm. because they have different goals than they had. It's a it's a different economic climate maybe than when they signed their deal. So sure. for a lot of partners, we're working through that. We've had we've got some you know great partnerships come through. Moda's I one that I always talk about that's obviously an incredible partner of ours and they help build up what we're doing in the community. But you look at First Tech, you look at Daimler, you look at Alaska Airlines, Nike. These are great partners of ours that are helping us you know, kind of continue to be indispensable to the community, not just us as a team, but those companies as well. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned the remix, and that was one of the first things I wanted to get to. What has been your take on the first season? And they're still obviously in the thick of it, of the remix. It seems like it's been very, very successful as far as I can tell. I was actually just up at the game the, the other night in my neighborhood in, in University of Portland. Nice draw. How has the remix uh, gone in their inaugural season thus far? We were so lucky, I think, going back to when we hired Hannah Grauert as our president over the summer to really find the right person. Hannah had grew up in our organization, went over to Nike and then came back here to lead this, you know, small but mighty team. And she's done a really incredible job, has a great, incredible team that she's running it with. Again, I think, you know, being able to do really interesting things like have Tixer as our ticketing partner, it's never a risk you would, you know, we would want to have taken, I think, on the big building because they didn't have the resume to pull that off, but we're happy to try it on the remix side. And we've learned a lot and it's been great. You know, so I you know, said that earlier, but using it as a, a real R and D development tool, um, not just for basketball, which is obvious, but for our business side too, has been really great. We've had some incredible wins on the business side in terms of sponsorship, in terms of retail. We're you know tops in the league in per cap, which is awesome. You know, kudos to again the design team, and we think we talked about this on the last podcast with Koji, but just a great design and mark and logo, and you know. We launched the team, I think, earlier than than anyone else. And I know we've talked about that, too. But it was so important to get it up and running for this season because of all the development we wanted our team to be doing on the basketball side. So anytime you don't have that full sort of 18 to 24 month window to to launch things like you're definitely, you know, giving yourself uh, one arm behind your back in terms of having the business structure. But our partners have shown up. Our fans have certainly shown up, and we think there's only opportunity to grow. And I you know, got to mention, too, the University of Portland has been an incredible yeah. partner in that, too. Yeah, shout out to, uh, to North Portland. Mm-hmm. Good, good people up there, I hear. The the big thing that happened recently, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, Dwayne, uh, the team getting the, the lease agreement with the city squared away. I know that's been a that's been a huge thing for the organization, obviously. If you're going to run a franchise and have it in a building, you have to, you have, to have a lease. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, it can go any number of ways. So one, just congratulations on getting that thing to the finish line, or at least this part of the finish right. line. But two, can you explain why that was important, one, to the organization, but two, to the fans and also to the city in general? Yeah. I mean, I think it's really important for our fans and, and folks to know that it really is, it is a first step. So, you know, we were running out of time to get a lease deal done. We were, we're, our intentions were to have a long-term lease deal with the city, you know, forked out. And we knew we were running up against it. And to our credit as an organization and to the city's credit, we just didn't want to get to the point where anyone's playing games around things like relocation, other things. We knew we needed more time to get this deal done. And we knew, knew we needed more time to get other stakeholders to the table to help form this public-private partnership. And it'll be other stakeholders who are benefiting from this building being here and this building that draws one and a half million visitors from all over the place for concerts and events and in games and it'll be the 600 million dollars that we have annually in economic impact of this building so it's that first step you know we've got the the deal to a place um and you know fans can read this to where you know we're able to to utilize some version of public private partnership to get towards some of the the capital expense projects that we need to get done in the building it's it sets the bar for later when we know we need a massive renovation to this building. Um, it's the oldest building in the NBA without a renovation, which when you walk through the building, you don't really notice that because I think the teams here have done such an incredible job of keeping the building up to date over the the nearly 30 years that it's been open. But you go visit other buildings, I think you, yeah, you, and you in know In comparison, this. yeah, as someone who's been to every arena and goes to them quite often, you're exactly right. Like Moda Center is in great shape, but it shows its age when compared to, to some of the other arenas out there. So you're, you're exactly right about that. Yeah, and I, I think... You know, we just we think that there's an opportunity. And again, most of this stuff is going to be, you know, from a fan perspective, how can we improve the fan experience? How can we 
um, make it a more um, inviting place? How can we make it more Portland? That's the feedback that we've always gotten. So those are the kinds of things that we'll be looking at doing. There's a lot of work still that needs to get done on that that process. But this important first step is done, and we're excited. So uh, my understanding is that it's, so it's five years with an option to extend for another five years. What's the, the purpose of that structure? It netted out um, to be that way because we had a 10-year option that we had to exercise by this October. Right, 24, yeah. So we said, well, instead of doing 10 years at the same terms, which we weren't willing to go on with you know lots changed since the <laughs> since the year that that lease was signed and we needed to be have something that reflected more of a market rate deal so we said let's turn that 10 year into two two five years essentially and just let's give us all more time to get a, a better more comprehensive long-term deal done so i guess what would maybe that deal look like i mean i'm sure there's negotiations and you could probably can say some things and not other things but right. for you and for the organization what would the optimal deal be for the lease of this building after the five years? So say you get a squared away, what would that look like? Yeah, I, I would just say, I think for us, you look, you can look around the league and you can look at teams. Um, you see all sorts of deals across the league, right? So Oklahoma City just did a deal where they're going to get a billion dollar building nearly and 900 million of that's going to be public and 90 million of that's going to be private. I'm not suggesting we're going to get anything <laughs> like that, but that is a deal that's out there in the market and, and we compete with that team on the court. And so that's a deal. You know, you look at Indi the Indiana Pacers, you look at um, San Antonio Spurs, you look at the Charlotte Hornets, you know, just some form, I think, of, of public-private ownership of, of not only the building, but of what happens in, in the building to get to get that to that renovation. So that's that's essentially when we say we're looking for a market rate deal, it's something along those lines so that we can do a pretty expansive renovation uh, to the building. And again, that'll be some public funds, but also uh, private funds as well. Like Paul built this building, put a lot of money into it in renovations over the last 30 years, and, and we've given a lot of money as part of a spectator facility fund back to the building from the building that's gone into other buildings around the city. And so, you know, th there's just needs to be some, I think, some version of a public private partnership. And the city recognizes that, which is how we got to the deal that we have now. And then they recognize it's going to be important to go to bat with us um, to talk to other entities about how, how we can all work together on this. And again, I think what's exciting about it is that there's this real opportunity for this to be a catalyst to growth of the whole entire Rose Quarter District. Mm -hmm. I think you look around the city and in terms of like bringing the city back from the, let's call it, you know, the, the pandemic where it's had, it's had a, a, a tough, tough time, but you know, there's so many visitors that come to Portland, whether it's the convention center, which is right down the street to the motor center for concerts and events. Um, there's just all this opportunity and this is sort of Portland's front door, if you will, for a lot of people. Sure. And so how can we help create a neighborhood and an, and an incredible neighborhood? And it's not, it's a little bit more nuanced because for us, it's having really strong partners like Albina Vision Trust, where this neighborhood used to be very much a, um, a proud black neighborhood. And what's happened over the years of urban renewal is that that neighborhood's gone away. Well, they want to bring a version of that neighborhood back. They want to bring life back to this neighborhood. And I think that we share that goal. We'd love to see this place be thriving 365 days a year, not just on nights when we have games and events. So how do we make that happen together. It seems like from what I've read and my understanding of the deal is that the the chance to renovate the building is one of the main kind of drivers of getting this squared away and and maybe kind of changing the relationship a little bit between the the organization and the city and and the building and the, and the lease and so on and so forth. So can you speak to the role of renovations and what you guys have already done to the building as of late and what you would like to see done to the building and how this agreement helps that along? I can break that down into a couple different ways. So I think there is CapEx projects that need to get done to the building. Those are maybe not the things that most fans see. Well, I, you know, we've, we've replaced the roof. Well, fans don't really see that. Yeah, yeah, we've, exactly. re we've replaced <laughs> the end zone steel. Uh, fans don't really experience the benefits of that. A lot of that is how quickly we can transfer back from an event to a concert to a basketball setup. I mean, certainly some fans have felt the effects of where their seats are and things like that. So when we're talking about CapEx, it's what are the things that around the building that make sure they keep the building in incredible shape that it's in. Renovations are more along the lines of, look, if, if we are able to make this building the kind of building that's going to be set up for the next 20 or 30 years, those are the sorts of the, the sort of big projects that, that we would need to do. 
I think there's a lot of master planning that still needs to be done, sure. quite frankly. Like we, we, we've we done versions of this in the past, and then every time a new building opens, it sort of changes the dialogue on what should be in a building. Like I'm looking really forward to seeing what the Clippers building opens mm, up yeah. this year because what Steve Ballmer has said is he wants that building to be an intense home court advantage, and they talk about the wall and like what types of things are going to be interesting in that arena that we can maybe utilize in ours compared to other buildings that have opened up recently. So that those are the kinds of things we'll, we'll have more work to do as we get there, but uh, and more to share with fans once we do that. What's the point of selling the building to the city? I think for some people, for lay people, to begin by myself mm-hmm. here, like you see that and you're like, oh, so now the – now the city owns Moda Center, so could you explain it all? Maybe kind of what the what the machinations of that are, the purpose of that. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 really, I mean, sort of three things, right? So for one, we have a really great relationship with the city. We already operate the Coliseum, which is a city owned building. We operate it on behalf of the city. We have a lot of trust in how the city lets us operate it, and they have a lot of trust in how we do it. They already operate the the city already owns um, Providence Park. And this building, there was always intention at the end of the lease that, you know, the way the lease operated was the city owned most of the ground that it was on, and then we owned the building. In reality, in a lot of markets, especially markets like ours, the city owns the building because it's a community asset. Sure, yeah. And so we didn't feel like we needed to have any any sense of ownership around it as related to the city. I mean, there's also benefits, quite frankly, in terms of, you know, should should we go to pursue this sort of public-private partnership? I think there'd be a, uh, there's a lot more um, interest, I think, from, from public entities to invest in a building that's publicly owned rather than one that's privately owned. And then I think the other big part of it is, you know, not a lot of arenas, again, in our market size um, pay any property tax, right? And so this allows us to not pay that property tax, which we've been pretty transparent about because of what we believe is that whatever comes out of this district is going to create more property tax benefit than just the building in in itself. So, And I mean, obviously creates all kinds of benefits for the city outside of just, you know, the actual property tax itself, which I'm guessing the, the benefits for the city are well in excess of probably what the property tax is. So it seems like a good deal for everybody. And, and I'd say like, we, you know, we've been really upfront with a lot of the, the political leaders that we've talked to about it because we didn't want that to be something that was like, oh, here, we're trying to do this under the shadow. Right. Of the night. Yeah. Like, We've said that and we've said that we have broader goals and, you know, thankfully we've seen a lot of support from the groups and folks that we've talked to, which is great. They see the bigger picture as well. So, I mean, you you did kind of speak to this a little bit already, but so I guess, you know, at the end of this five years, hopefully a deal gets done. What, I guess, what does that look like? You talked about a public-private partnership. Does that just lock the team in to Portland for forever? Like what's the main end goal there, I guess? Yeah, I think it's important. That's a good question, Casey. I, I think it's important for folks to realize the five years is just buying us more time. We hope to not get to the end of the five year yeah. deal, right? We hope to begin quickly working on what the long term deal looks like. It was just we needed it and that's why I've called it a bridge. It's like this is a bridge agreement to take the pressure off, but let's let's start tomorrow. And and I think we had the city council meeting on Wednesday and then we met again with the city on Thursday. So like the work's not done and there's a lot of I think of uh, work that we we still want to get done to start doing that long term deal now. You know, ideally at the end of the day, our goal, a market rate deal that binds the team to Portland for the next generation, right? I mean, the Blazers have been here for 54 years and have had incredible fan support that entire time. Um, again, even in a year like this, we're 13th in the league in attendance, which is really incredible wow. given where things are. I mean, this this fan base loves this team. So there's no reason there's no reason to think that we shouldn't be here for you know generations to come and i think that's what we're working towards switching gears here real path before i let you go Dwayne. which also by the way thank you for for taking the time last time we talked we talked a little about WNBA and the prospect of the WNBA coming to portland obviously since then there's been a few issues there any update on on that or or anything to to kind of look forward to or anything anything kind of in the works in, in that regard i know that that the blazers aren't necessarily the team that would or the organization that would own it but seeing as how it would happen to the building, I imagine you might have some idea. Yeah, I, you know, I always talk to really interested parties who want to bring a WNBA team to Portland. I know that the W is, you know, Kathy has said as much, uh, Kathy Engelbert, the, the commissioner, 
that wants to have four expansion teams. She's got one in San Francisco, and she'd like to have three more. I can say for sure that there are definitely interested parties who believe a lot in Portland, and I think believe in it as a sports town, believe in it surely as a women's sports town if you look at the, the numbers that the Thorns are doing. So there's no shortage of interest. I think we stand by always interested and committed to helping whatever we can to bring it here because for me the the dream is to have basketball sort of 360 you know sure, yeah. like all year round you have the summer w and then in the in the winter fall spring w, nba would be would be phenomenal and uh, i think it would do incredibly well here so we you know we're here to support it you know there had always been these reports that you know maybe the arena was the reason it wasn't, um, to be clear, and it certainly isn't now that this bridge extension is done. Like We are excited to bring any team on board, and we have multiple options, obviously, here on the Rose Quarter to host them. The other kind of one of the big things we talked about last time, too, uh, the TV deal. Obviously, I think that even changed since we talked last. Any updates on that? I know that it's difficult for some fans to, to see our games this year, mm-hmm. so I'm curious, and I, and I know that because of maybe some of the changes. I don't know if that's triggered anything, but is there any update or, or anything maybe that, that fans can look forward to or or just consider, I guess, in regards to, to the TV deal? Not really for this year, but maybe for, for seasons going forward. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that it'll give fans a ton of, of sauce, but it is one of the top things that I think about on a daily basis. Yeah, the RSN industry as a whole, it feels very personal to Portland than it is because our games are harder to watch than been in some time. And that's unfortunate fortunate and that's also happening in other places around the league and around other sports and we need to have a better solution for our fans to watch our games you know creating friction to that process is is not great i think we have a really young exciting awesome fun to watch product and i'm and i'm worried that fans aren't getting the chance to be able to see it because you definitely see these really awesome glimpses of what this team can become but we're not making it easy on fans to be able to watch it. So it's something that we're spending a lot of time on. You know, we have we have this agreement with Root. Root has been an awesome partner in a lot of different ways. They 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 truly have. Like it's very it's always been really important to us to produce our own broadcast and we get to produce our own broadcast. It's always been important to us to be able to try things on our broadcast and certainly we've done a ton of things to to to, to do different things within our broadcast. But it doesn't matter at the end of the day if nobody can see them. And so for us, it's something that we're focused on a ton. We've seen, we've seen other teams in, in this league and others like the, the Suns and the Jazz and the, and the Vegas Golden Knights do really interesting things over the air. Like that, that stuff's intriguing to us. I, we, we know that when our games were over the air on KGW, um, you know, at the end of, you know, 2015, 16, 17, those ratings did really, really well. So, you know, that of course would be interesting to us. But we, you know, we, we've got, we've got, uh, we're on it, and we're trying to figure out the best solution for for our fans for sure. And I, I just want to state too that I feel like sometimes there's a little, conf- I don't want to say confusion, but just maybe a little misunderstanding from fans. Sometimes it's like the team wants fans to be able to see their games. A, a deal that doesn't allow fans to see our games is a bad deal for us. So like, I just hope people know that that's not we don't like that. You know, like, and sometimes they get the sense people are like, well, you know, you don't care. And it's like. Mm-hmm. No, we we care because if you can't see our games, like that means a lot of bad things downstream that we would like to avoid. So that's a hundred percent. I just want to reiterate that you know, as someone who works for the team, and I realize I'm probably editorializing a little bit too much here, but we want you to be able to see the game, point blank. The more people that watch our games, the better. Right. You know, you can get really inside baseball on this stuff and talk about how it got to this point, and it's. You know, Root wants fans to see our games too, right? Everyone wants our fans to be able to see our games. And the industry has just really met this very interesting inflection point yeah. where there's just, there really has to be change within this. And and I worry about it in, in two ways because I grew up in Chicago. WGN was how I watched a lot of games and it was I got way into the Bulls and I got way into the White Sox and I was able to watch games easily and I went and was able to play those sports. And I think what I worry about as someone who thinks about the future of sport in general is we've made youth sports hard for kids to engage in and play. And that's a whole other rabbit hole we can go down. And we've made sports on TV hard to watch. And there's so many things competing for kids' attention. My own kids, I can tell you, are very interested in things. They they love sports, of course, but it competes with Fortnite and YouTube and all these other things that have a real stranglehold on their attention. So what are we doing as an industry to make people fall in love with basketball? And that's something that we have to spend a lot more time uh, focused on. 
Well, that's a great place to stop, Dwayne. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Casey. This is always fun. So there you go. Some really interesting stuff there from Dwayne Hankins, Trailblazers, President of Business Operations. When you're in a role like that, you obviously have to be very measured with the kind of things you say. So I really appreciate the candor there. And I think also, too, you can probably infer a few things from some of the things that Dwayne said, things that probably just can't be said outright at this point, but things that you can probably assume the team is considering or at least looking into as they try to figure out ways to better improve the fan experience, both in the arena and on television. And that's going to do it for this edition of The Briefcase. Thanks so much for joining me, as always. We'll be back later on this week with new additions, upcoming back-to-back versus the Hawks and the Knicks, then hitting the road for two games versus the Pelicans and the Chicago Bulls. Plenty of stuff to talk about in between now and then on The Briefcase and on the Blazers' balcony with Brooke Olsendam and on Section 113 with Travis and Michael. Go to trailblazers.com slash podcast to find all those options and more. Like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. I am Casey Holdall. Go Blazers. Go Blazers.